Hello, welcome everyone to this webinar on what is new, what is known on protein and metabolic programming and long-term health for our children. The basic message of this webinar is about appropriate nutrition during the first dozen days, how it can contribute to a reduced risk for obesity lifetime long. So it's about convincing you that early nutrition, early in life, does have long-term health impacts. And it's all about the first thousand days. Now what is important to realize is that the first thousand days do not start at birth, but that's, it starts at conception. So it's the nine months of pregnancy, in the first year of life and the second year of life, which is fundamental, fundamentally important because appropriate nutrition do the mother during pregnancy, but we will focus on the baby from birth up to the age of two years, how appropriate nutrition will have a health impact uh, on that child for the rest of its life. It will determine physical growth, but also determine metabolic programming. So the programming that takes place during this period has a lifetime long impact on many aspects of future um, aspects. And of course, it's multifactorial. So the environmental factors play also a role in programming those first dozen days. And it's partly genetic determined, that's for sure. But genes are sometimes active and sometimes they are quiet. So the activity of the genes are determined by the environment. And this is what we call the epigenetic effects, which are dependent on toxins, medications, hormones, but also nutrients. So stimuli influence gene expression through epigenetic processes that selectively switch genes on and off. And another important factor is the gastrointestinal microbiome. So it's multifactorial. It's not only genes, it's not only environment, it's not only microbiome, it's not only nutrition, but nutrition plays a major role in the switching on and off of those genes. So appropriate nutrition will help to set the appropriate genes on and off and therefore does have an important role in um, prevention of obesity. And this is very nicely illustrated of what we know from the Second World War and mothers which were pregnant. Because there was clearly a negative impact if a mother was starving when she was pregnant. That has been shown. But what has also been shown is that the period of fetal life when that malnutrition occurred had different consequences on the health outcome of the baby. So what this slide shows you is that if the mother was early in pregnancy starving when the famine winter was there in the Netherlands, then it had mainly um, effects on coronary heart disease, hyperlipidemia, reduced blood clotting, obesity, and schizophrenia. While if it was during midterm, midterm pregnancy, then it was related to obstructive airway disease, microalbuminuria, and during late pregnancy, the effects were again different. So it's clearly that it is not only a question of quality of nutrition, it's also a question of during which period that malnutrition, overnutrition, normal nutrition is occurring and that the effects are different. We have to be aware that there is a rising trend worldwide of childhood obesity. India has the second highest number of obese children, now almost 15 million 
five years ago, 14.4. And at the left part of the slide, you see how the number of overweight or obese children under five years increased from 1990 and how the prospection is that it will fur further increase. So we have absolutely to try to do something to decrease this tendency to um, in increasing prevalence of obesity. Because Indian newborns are also smaller with comparable or higher adiposity compared to European babies. And that's multi-generational undernourished populations have developed the thrifty genes, the gene that will predispose to more easily become obese. And early protein intake plays a major role into that. The early protein intake has an important role in a promoting appropriate or inappropriate growth. So excessive protein intake in infancy will result in increased insulin releasing amino acids or is a consequence of that. And as a consequence of that, you will have higher secretion of insulin and in IGF factor one. More insulin means also decreased satiety, so children which will eat more. And as a result of that, you have, of course, an increased adipogenic activity. So you will have more adipogenesis, more fat, increased growth, and so uh, increased weight gain and risk for obesity. If you focus then on which are those insulin releasing amino acids, it's mainly four different amino acids, valine, leucine, isoleucine, and triolin. So they stimulate the secretion of insulin. So they should be manipulated if, if for to decrease the risk to develop later obesity. And this is a very complicated slide, but just it shows you that how the wrong amino acid or the good amino acids to a higher or lower level stimulate the uh, MTRC1 pathway, which is a growth signaling pathway. And the more you activate it, the higher the risk for obesity becomes. So amino acids energy growth factors such as insulin and insulin-like growth factors play an important role in activated that pathway. So the more of those insulin secreting amino acids, the more this pathway will be stimulated, the higher the risk for later obesity. Breast milk is of course the best way how to feed all infants. And breast milk has per definition protein with a good quality and good quantity because it's appropriate to nature. So it influences growth and short and long-term health. And what has been shown that breastfed infants compared to non-breastfed infants, well, that breastfed infants have a much lower risk to develop overweight and obesity in childhood and later in life. And that at risk of morbidity and mortality due to infectious disease is also decreased. A decreased risk for type 2 diabetes and a decreased risk of overfeeding the baby. And the right part of this slide shows you that every month of exclusive breastfeeding more decreases the risk for the child to become obese with 4%. Or more. So the longer you are breastfed, the lower the risk to become overweight, to become obese. And therefore, it's very logic that the WHO states that breastfeeding is absolutely the best way how to feed all infants. So breast milk is also very dynamic. It's not the same the first day of life or after two weeks or after one month or after three months, the composition of breast milk changes all the time. So the composition of breast milk is adapted to the changes in growth because an infant grows much faster the first weeks of life than after a couple of months. So by adapting to the decrease in growth velocity and associated decrease in protein requirements, per kilogram body weight, the decreasing protein content of breast milk will result in a protection 
for overnutrition for the infants because it avoids excessive protein intake. And it will also protect the mother from malnutrition because it avoids excessive energy expenditure for the mother. So benefits of continued breastfeeding on long-term health are obvious. As we already said in the previous slide, it decreases the risk for overweight by 4% for every additional month of breastfeeding. And prolonged partial breastfeeding or and in combination feeding, breastfeeding with other food is also associated with a reduced risk of overweight later in life. So the optimal growth rate is obviously that of a breastfed baby. So the WHO 2006 growth standards describe growth in breastfed infants under these optimal conditions. And infants on other milk diets show a different growth. They show an accelerated growth that is attributed to the higher protein levels in the milk diet. So it's not so much a difference between zero and three months. There is little difference in gain in weight and length between breastfed and infants fed other diets. But between three and 12 months, then the difference becomes obvious. Infants fed old milk diets, which means diets with high protein intake, gain weight and length much more rapidly than breastfed babies. So decrease the protein content in uh, milk diets with protein of good quality is something which could be helpful for those babies which cannot be breastfed. Let us look again at the weight gain between zero and one year old and long-term prediction. So data from Italy, the US and Chile, almost combining data on almost 500 infants, show you that the variance of BMI at 60 months, so the age of five years, is explained by the weight gain during the first year of life. There is a very strong association, as you can see. So the faster you grow to, during the first year of life, the faster you will continue to grow. So if you have excessive weight gain, as in those infants with a milk diet compared to breastfeeding between three months and 12 months, you will continue to have an excessive uh, weight gain up to when you're six years old. So breast milk is a natural way of programming against excessive adiposity in adulthood. So the link between growth pathways and early protein hypothesis is moderated by both quantity but also quality of protein intake. So it's not only decreasing the amount, it's also choosing the good quality of the protein. And the difference in protein contribution to energy intake is illustrated in this slide. So breast milk contains only 1.2 gram proteins per 100 milliliter, while cow's milk contains three times more. But that means also that breast milk protein contributes for three times less of the total energy intake and cow's milk protein, so it's 10% compared to 26%. And that has, of course, an impact on the weight gain of the child. So breast milk protein is the gold, star, gold standard sorry, for the protein quality. And how is the protein quality def defined? Well, it's by the weight casein ratio, but also with the amino acid profile. And the insulinic amino acids, they are highlighted on this slide and we discussed them previously, uh, they are needed for normal growth and development, of course. And breast milk does have these amino acids in the correct amounts, how nature selects it. So the higher the intake of these amino acids in non-breast infants may lead to metabolic malprogramming because they are regulated, regulating growth. And if you take the appropriate amount, your growth will be normal. But if you take too much of them, your growth will be increased, will be abnormal, it will be excessive. And that's causing the increased risk for obesity. So weight predominance is a key parameter for protein quality. 
it come, the left part of the slide shows you the difference between uh, for whey and casein composition and the protein efficiency, the, the biological value, and it shows you that whey casein ratios, appropriate whey casein ratios are very important because they have different nutritional properties. They have also a different gastric emptying rate. What you see, GRI is gastric uh, uh, residual activity. So it's the opposite from emptying. It's what stays in the stomach. But, uh, but and you see that with whey and human milk, it's not a huge difference. But with casein, that would be a huge difference. And the way casein ratio of mother's milk during early life it's about 70 to 30 percent, while that in cow's milk is just the opposite. It's about 20 to 80 percent even. So cow's milk contains three times more protein than mother's milk, but the casein whey ratios are also completely opposite. That means that the composition, the protein composition of cow's milk is really not adapted to the nutritional needs of our infants. High protein quality is an essential prerequisite for low protein quantity, of course, because otherwise you, your child would be at risk for malnutrition. So low protein quantity in a milk diet is possible only if your quality is guaranteed. So the primary limiting factor in reducing the total protein concentration in milk diets of infants is the ability to provide sufficient quantities of those essential amino acids. Now, in general, infants do ingest too much protein if they are not exclusively breastfed. So protein intakes of infants are generally well above the requirements, so protein content of the milk diet should be reduced, as stated by the European Food Safety Authority now some six years ago. And breastfeeding is associated with a lower prevalence of obesity at the age of five to six years. That's illustrated nicely in this slide. In blue, never breastfed. In brown, ever breastfed. And you see that there is clearly a reduced risk for both overweight and ob obesity at the age of five to six years. So of course, at five to six years, those children are for a long time no longer breastfed. It means that the difference in weight gain that you get early in life is continued and that there is indeed a difference in metabolic programming depending on the amount and quality of protein that you get early in life. So breastfeeding is associated with a 20% lower risk of overweight or obesity uh, later in life, as illustrated in this slide. And that's, again, related to that high protein intake during the first two years in life. Because in brown, you see the high protein intake, and in blue, you see the low protein intake. And then you see that the earlier adiposity uh, rebound is uh, with the high protein intake, while with the low protein intake, you get that weight gain much later. And so you get at the age of 20 years, a significant difference in BMI, depending on the amount of protein intake during the first months, two years of life. So again, a, a strong argument that early programming is really happening and that early nutrition during the first months of life will determine your health outcome for your lifetime long. And that effect of high protein intake on metabolic outcomes at six months, it's a link to weight gain. Because again, if you get more of those plasma insulinogenic amino acids, you get more IGF-1, you will be at increased risk to intake more, to have a higher intake and to have a faster weight gain and length gain. So high protein intake influences metabolic outcomes, link to early weight gain. 
So plasma amino acids and acylcarnitine concentrations in six months old infants with high or low protein milk diet or being breastfed are illustrated in this slide and it shows you how um, the differences occur uh, according to the different weight gain. So what are the prerequisites for a low protein milk diet? You need a very high protein quality to ensure infant's amino acid requirements are satisfied. Because you want, of course, also no malnutrition. Now, you need a clinical proof of comparable growth patterns as in breastfed infants. And the clinical evidence of safety in infants. And low protein intake is needed because it could help to reduce the obesity risk in non-breastfed infants. There is a rapid postprandial weight gain if there is a high protein intake. So you get a rapid weight gain, almost four times higher risk to be obese as an adult if you get a too high protein intake during early life. So randomized controlled trials have been performed and meta-analyses have been performed in infants fed with low protein diet and showed that there is a similar growth pattern and BMI with those low protein formulas compared to breastfed infants. That's illustrated in this slide, brown breastfeeding, blue, in blue, low protein milk diets. And it shows you that for the meta-analysis in children, breastfed or low protein diet from three to six months, that there is no difference in weight gain up to the age of five years. So the difference that you saw earlier in weight gain between milk diet and Breastfed infants has disappeared if you give a milk diet with a low protein content, with good quality proteins. That's equally important. So lower protein intake results in a lower obesity risk at the age of six years. Obesity at age six years in infants who received high or low protein or, or were breastfed in infancy is illustrated on this slide. Green breastfed, 3%, brown low protein, 4.4%, blue high protein, 10%. Obvious difference. Two times and a half more with high protein than in breastfed infants, and two times more with uh, high protein than with low protein milk diet. Weight gain and low protein milk diet is in line with the WHO means was shown here in this slide, weight at four months in infants fed a low protein. And you see the zero line is the WHO standard. And you see it's not still, it's still not exactly the same. And of course it again arguments that breastfeeding is by far the best way how to feed all infants. But it's non-significant different with this low protein milk diet. And the same is true for length, where there is a, um, it's almost at the zero line. So our low protein milk diet brings that uh, infant feeding opportunity, a child feeding opportunity closer to, to the result of the best feeding. And breastfeeding remains, of course, the uh, absolutely best way how to feed all those infants. And this is also that health benefit, the decreased risk of obesity, is of course related to economic benefits for our healthcare system as a consequence of that low protein intake. So the risk of developing obesity is reduced by 10% as we saw. The likelihood of obesity related diseases will then of course also decrease with a couple of persons. And that will result in a 4% reduction of diet health costs. So it saves also on the socioeconomic aspect. So early intervention impacts long-term health. I hope that this presentation made that clear for you. And again, breastfeeding is by far the best way how to feed uh, all the infants. And late intervention will only have limited benefits because then it's too late. What we need to do is to do prevention 
as early as possible. And so a low protein milk diet may therefore have long-term consequences um, and long-term benefits for that individual. So in summary, prevalence of childhood and adult obesity is increasing worldwide and it's a huge problem in many uh, countries like India. Obesity is associated with negative long-term outcomes. That's also obvious. And treating obesity is a challenge because of the metabolic programming. Appropriate nutrition during the first thousand days is therefore critical. It's essential. And as I said several times during this presentation, breast milk provides the optimal nutrition for appropriate growth. And therefore, every effort should be made to stimulate breastfeeding as much as possible. Whey predominant protein as present in mother's milk is easy to digest. Accelerate growth and high protein intake in infancy increases the risk of later obesity. So protein quality, protein quantity, both can influence long-term health. Low protein diets have shown growth in line with the WHO, WHO child growth standards for breastfed infants. It's almost the same. Lower intake of protein and hence um, those insulin secreting amino acids during infancy lowers the risk of obesity later in life. So it's not only questioning of lowering the proteins, it's also a question of appropriate um, amounts of the appropriate amino acids. Breastfeeding, and if not possible, a low protein, a low, a low protein content, high protein quality diet helps to reduce the risk of those diseases which, uh, such as uh, obesity, which can be prevented or at least can be significantly reduced and which will have a positive impact on health outcome later in life. And with this last slide, I would like to thank you for your attention and hope that I convinced you that breastfeeding is the best for all infants and that our, if an infant cannot be breastfed, that a, a milk diet with good quality protein, low content protein, low quant quantity protein um, is better than the opposite high protein and low quality protein. Thank you for your attention. So, I guess I will hear some of the questions. So there are several questions on how um, to reach that low protein, good quality um, amount. Um, and that's of course where it's important um, to select the right milk diet and um, milk industry overall plays an important role there to get that second choice feeding milk diet as close as possible to the composition of mother's milk. So 
what it in fact shows is that um, cow's milk or any other animal milk needs to be adapted to be close or closer to the composition and effect of mother's milk. And um, what uh, is happening now during the recent years is that we became aware of the role of protein in um, the, the risk of developing obesity. And so that the right amount, but also the right composition of that protein is very important. Question, so that's for uh, the first five, six questions, which all relate to, to this topic. How breastfeeding reducing obesity? Well, we just uh, tried to explain that. Do the breast milk of mothers with a veg, veg diet poor in protein quality than in non-veg diet mother? Well, in fact, what I would like to say is that nature uh, chooses always the benefit of the infant. So a mother needs to be severely malnourished before the quality of her mother's milk will change. So whatever a mother eats, whether it's what we call normal for our Western diet or vegan or veganistic, um, does not matter so, so much as long as that mother is normally nourished, the quality of, of her mother's milk will be optimal for the infant. Um, in subcontinent like India, mothers are usually anemic and undernutrished. Is exclusive breastfeeding enough to babies for first five months or shall we start early weaning? Well, Again, as I just answered, um, the mother needs to be severely malnourished before the quality of her mother's milk will decrease. So in general, I would say yes, um, there is uh, no reason to think that the mother's milk will not be adapted to um, give exclusive breastfeeding up to the age of six months as recommended to the, by the WHO. So in unfortunate cases when the mother cannot breastfeed, is adapted cow's milk a preferable option? Um, yes, well, absolutely. What I think is what I try to explain to you is that um, of course, breastfeeding is the best way to feed all infants. And as I said during the presentation, every effort should be made to stimulate breastfeeding as much as possible. But not all babies can be breastfed. We have to accept that also. Um, for instance, if the mother herself has a severe disease, that might make breastfeeding, not the optimal way. I'm just thinking mother who developed cancer, who needs chemotherapy. Uh, so there are certainly situations where um, breastfeeding is unfortunately not possible. And so that's when, why, when we need a second choice feeding, absolutely second choice, never prime, uh, first choice, of course. And the, but I think on the other side, when an infant cannot be breastfed, he has the, that infant has the right to as an as good second choice infant feeding as possible. And therefore, the change in protein quality and quantity is very important to bring the second choice feeding closer to the first choice. And the second choice will always be second choice and never replace the first choice. That's also obvious. So again, every effort to stimulate the first choice as much as possible. But it goes further than that. It's also, it's the first two years. And so uh, children start to consume milk diets 
after breastfeeding. And then also ex excessive protein um, is still uh, causing harm. Uh, we did a study in Belgium looking at the dietary intake of children between two years and three years old. Um, so just after those uh, first thousand days, but they had in general a protein intake which was three times above the considered safe limit. So much of the, many of our young children do eat too much protein, too high uh, amount of protein. And that, the re that was also clearly related to uh, obesity. Would they can cause milk in their childhood? So again, questions about yeah the early programming, but uh, I think the whole presentation was to make you aware that that early programming uh, really exists, um, so that uh, the amount of protein taken during the first months of life will have an impact on your health outcome the rest of your life. So can cow's milk be <laughs> diluted with water in early infancy? That was just also the importance why we stressed the quality of the protein. So it's not only the fact that cow's milk contains three times too much protein, because then indeed you could dilute the cow's milk and you get less protein, but um, your amino acid concentrations are still not appropriate, even if you uh, dilute the cow's milk. And so the protein quality will then suffer. And, um, and as a consequence, you will see malnourished children. So it's not a dilution of the cow's milk is certainly not the solution. Uh, it is diminishing the protein content, but also playing with the um, percentage of different amino acids, um, because that is what is also uh, of major importance. So it's not only the amount, it's also the um, different percentages uh, of different amino acids within that protein, which is important. So how much protein is low protein for an infant? What it, it's, if it's the quality is good, it's the same as in mother's milk. It's about 1.2 gram per 100 milliliters. And a lot of questions about um, also that more is better. And that's, I think, yeah, something which is the consequence of um, malnutrition is that you think, let us give more, then uh, the result will be better. Yeah, that's, but more is not always better as we try to show. It's, uh, it's also the uh, percentage of the amino acids, also the quality. Um, so uh, more protein will increase the risk for later. Uh, obesity. And that's also true, for instance, in preterm infants or in uh, small for gestational AIDS infants. When an infant is born with a weight which is considered too low for its gestational age, it's clear from literature also that if that weight gain um, goes too fast, that that child is at a high risk to decrease, to, to, to develop obesity later in life. And the smaller, the slower the weight gain goes in those children born with uh, an underweight, the better their final outcome. So it's better to go slowly to the normal weight 
than to go rapidly to the normal weight because you induce metabolic programming and the, what you stimulate during the first weeks or months of life will have a lifetime uh, effect. I think I answered most of the questions. The only another question about epigenetic effects. Um, well, it's true that also that um, the effects, epigenetic effects on genes, takes probably some generations. That's also something we learned. So um, once the epigenetic effect is there, um, it may take some generations to change that epigenetic effect. So the um, hormone pathway as shown in one of the slides, once your population is predisposed for that, it may take uh, a few generations to decrease again, to turn that epigenetic effect off. But that does not mean that we should not start with it. So, Dear participants in this webinar, I think I answered most of your questions. Uh, at least I tried to do so. I tried also to show you that breastfeeding is by far the best way to feed all infants once again, but that a milk diet with low protein content, and with low we mean similar to the protein content as in mother's milk, with high quality, and with high quality we mean similar to the composition of uh, mother's milk. So not only the amount, but also the composition of the different amino acids of the whey casein ratio close to that of mother's milk will bring the milk diet for infants closer to the golden standard, which remains the exclusively breastfed baby. I would like to thank you for your attention and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you.